Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Q&Play, my monthly Q&A series where I answer your questions in a rambly, unscripted format. First up, we have a set of questions from Klaus Muller, NT, and Zarenia, all of which are about my LEGO collection, which you guys may have seen in the community post where I ask for questions for this video. Alright, first up from Klaus, which of the LEGO ATTEs that have been released over the years do you think is the best? So if you don't know what that means, that is a walker from Star Wars, which is a little franchise you may not have heard of. But anyway, look, jokes aside, the walker has been interpreted into a Lego sets four separate times, and I own the latest one, the 2022 version, which comes with Commander Cody and some of his orange 312 clone troopers, which is based on Revenge of the Sith. And then there's one from Attack of Clones, the Clone Wars show, and then one from Attack of Clones way back in the early 2000s. Anyway, point is, which one is my favorite? My favorite is the latest one, because that's the one I own. Sorry if that was incomprehensible. Moving on to NT, how long have you been collecting Legos? Favorite set or theme? I've been collecting Legos pretty much my entire life, ever since childhood. I think the oldest set that still survives is the ATDP, which is another Star Wars walker. It's the three-legged one. You'll probably see it in this bunch of footage that I'm putting on screen. It's on the top shelf. It is old, I believe. It first came out in 2008 or 2007. It's definitely not a new set by any means. But in terms in terms of like a lot of LEGO collections, I know that mine is pretty humble and I don't have any super rare sets by any means. A lot of the sets that I've collected over the years, even ones that nowadays would fetch me a really pretty penny, have unfortunately been lost to time. I used to have a whole Power Miners collection and only one fusion set remains also on the top shelf of my LEGO shelf assembly thing that I've got going on. My three favorite sets that I own are probably the three that are displayed next to the TV and in my living room. You'll see them in this footage, but the Lego Ninjago City, the Horizon Zero Dawn Tall Neck, and the Jurassic Park T-Rex Rampage are three of my favorite sets. They are all recent releases, which I'm happy to say. LEGO's been pumping out some really good stuff. These three sets are just amazing. I'm a big fan of Horizon Zero Dawn. It's not my favorite game of all time by any means, but it is a really solid game, and I love the designs of all the machines, and the Tall Neck LEGO set is just beautiful. I'm a huge Jurassic Park fan, so this T-Rex Jurassic Park Gates was super nostalgic, and just in general just looks amazing. And finally, the LEGO Ninjago City set is just beautiful. I don't know if you're seeing it right now or if you've already seen it, but it's such a gorgeous and gigantic build. It is, I believe, the most expensive LEGO set I own. It's by far the one with the most pieces, but it was worth every penny. That set is legitimately one of the coolest things that I own. I absolutely love it. In terms of favorite theme, yes, in case you haven't noticed by how I talked about the Ninjago set, I'm a big Ninjago fan. I was a big Ninjago fan when I was a teenager, and now I'm a big Ninjago fan still. I mean, I don't watch the show anymore. It is a kid's show after all, but... I did really enjoy the sets, and I still do today. I haven't bought Ninjago set other than the city for a while, but hopefully I'll get back into it. Star Wars is also something that I'm pretty into, so I also like the Star Wars sets. Alright, I'm trying to get on from this as fast as possible. I love LEGO, but I know a lot of you guys probably aren't into LEGO, and this is all incomprehensible to some of you, and I'm sorry about that, but I do want to talk about LEGO. Because Lego is awesome, it's a big part of my life. Final question from Zarenia. Have you ever used Lego in lieu of a token piece as a Warforge? I don't know why Warforge specifically. Maybe they saw I had a lot of battle droids or something. But anyway, look, point is, no, I haven't used Lego as a piece in my games. I made tokens when I was first starting out. And now I use a VTT, a virtual tabletop. So it was not necessary. All right, Lego discussion over. Though sound off in the comments. If you guys love Lego too... Tell me, because I want to be validated in my man-child habits that I have cultivated over my life. Alright, anyway, moving on to a question from Mal T. Hey Crispy, I'm trying to get back into D&D again, but one of my worries is not having a good backstory. I'm not very good at thinking up a good backstory or role-playing on the fly, so I was wondering, do you have any tips you could give? Here is the advice that I always give to players whenever they are trying to come up with their backstory. I don't think you should rip off a character from something that you love because I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I think the creativity of coming up with your own story is a big part of the reason why a lot of people play D&D and experiencing that is a big part of the game. However, I do think you should base your backstory that you create 
off of things that you enjoy. If you guys are familiar with my show Shadow over Kerkonos, the NPC that I've been using a lot is Kalia Solfero, who is based off of Dishonored and Game of Thrones, two franchises that I really, really love. Emily Caldwin from Dishonored and Arya Stark from Game of Thrones were huge inspirations for that character, and I love those two characters. Therefore, I really enjoy playing Kalia. You need to create a character that you are going to love. Don't try to create something just original for originality's sake or cool for cool's sake. Create something that you are going to enjoy, something that you vibe with. Also, remember that you're not making this character for an audience or a judge. You're making it for a D&D game that you're playing with your friends. You're not under any obligation to make it good by the rankings of some critics. You're not being critiqued by some professionals. You're just making this for fun. Make sure that it is fun. That is the most important thing. Question from Emerald Inferno Zero. Hey, Crispy, big fan. Anyway, my question is simple. What is your favorite horror story you've ever read? I have read literally hundreds of horror stories, so this is actually a really hard question to answer because I have no idea. But I will say from recent memory, I did read a story about a girl who was at her table and there was a sudden wash of anxiety and just she suddenly started crying in front of the table, which is obviously a nightmare for a lot of people. That's just a really stressful thing to even think about, having that kind of emotionality in front of people who you don't know very well. But seeing how her group responded with kindness and sympathy, that was great. And seeing how the community as a whole, how the RPG Horror Story subreddit you know, came around this person was like, look, you're good. You're all good. There's nothing wrong with shedding a few tears. That's all okay. I thought that was just, it was just really wholesome to see. I loved seeing that kind of thing. Other than that, my favorite horror story for just horror sake that I can remember is probably the airship story. I mean, it's just so legendary. I did it on this channel and it was really fun to read, especially since it was the first RPG horror story that ever really got me into the genre and made me fall in love with this weird genre that we've cultivated. Next question from Jose Sanchez. I've been playing with a group online. We're all pretty close and I've been playing close to six months now, but recently I noticed that our DM spouse may be fudging rolls. She's the only one who doesn't roll through D&D Beyond. She never seems to roll below 15. How do I bring up this concern to the DM? Love the content, Crispy. Much love. That's very nice of you to say. Okay. How do you bring this up? I think you just bring it up exactly the way you conveyed it to me. That wasn't at all mean or rude. It was just you bringing up a concern. Talk to the DM about it and have that person talk to their spouse. I think that's the best way to go about this. There's obviously some love between them because they're married and I'm sure that they could have a discussion about this in a mature way, probably better. I mean this in no offensive way, but probably better than you could with the spouse because, you know, again, they are married to each other. So, yeah, talk to the DM about it. Hopefully, they would be willing to speak to their spouse, and hopefully, all can come to an amiable conclusion. I will say, it's perfectly possible that the spouse is just lucky. I know that seems kind of crazy, but I've seen it before where someone just has a streak of really good roles or simply has some really good and powerful bonuses, and that allows them to consistently get higher results on dice. It happens. It is totally possible. I do wish you the best of luck in this endeavor, my friend, but yeah, that's my simplest and best, in my opinion piece of advice. Question from Gold Diamond. Why a cartoon rat with the plague Dr. Mass named Crispy? I have answered this question before. By God, so many times, I will answer it again. The reason why it's a cartoon rat with the plague Dr. Mask is because I thought that the design was cool. That's it. I thought of it because my Minecraft skin's a dude in a plague doctor suit and my logo is a rat. The reason it's a rat is because I don't know. My friends called me Scabbers in junior high for some reason. I think that they were all Harry Potter fans. Point is that from that day forward, I use rats as like my logo and such. And Scabbers was my gamer tag and a lot of stuff. If you listen or, or not listen, but if you pay attention to the chat of many of the games I play, you will see that it's Scabbers. So there you go. Where did Crispy come from? One time, my friend saw me in a suit because I was going to a nice formal event and he called me Crisp. And from there it devolved. And now all of my friends call me Crispy. So when I was making my YouTube channel, I was like, okay, everyone calls me Crispy in real life. Might as well make it my virtual name too. Now here we are. Question from the weirdly curly plant stem. So my longtime Dungeons and Dragons group is on the verge of breaking up due to real life stuff. And I don't know what to do. Should I just let the group come to a quick and relatively painless end or look at moving our games online? If you think that we should go online, which platforms do you recommend? I'm sorry for all the questions. I just don't know how to proceed. 
totally sympathize with you. My group would have dissolved if we had not gone online. So my instinct is to instantly recommend, yes, go online. Went great for me, but it went great for me. That won't go great for everyone. My friends and I played video games together, so we were used to communicating online. We also were really good friends even before we played Dungeons & Dragons together. We were really, really good friends. So, of course, we were inclined to stay together. Dungeons & Dragons game or not, we probably would have continued talking. I think that this depends on your friend group, it depends on the people that you are talking about. I don't know your group, so I'm inclined to say yes, continue online. If they're interested in that, try it. But if you don't think your group can work online, I don't think there's anything wrong with just letting it have an amiable conclusion. Not many D&D groups get forewarning on when it's all going to come to an end. It usually just happens. So the fact that you have some idea may be an opportunity for you to give a memorable end to the campaign that you're all happy with. That might be good as well. In terms of VTT recommendations, I can't guarantee that it's the best, but I do think Foundry is really, really damn good. I love Foundry to death. It is so great. I have used Roll20 very rarely. I played D&D in person for a long time, and the one time I used Roll20, it was for the Dice Goblins game, and I was a player. And I'm gonna be honest, guys, it was, in my opinion, very basic. I was not impressed by it by any means, but when I started using Foundry as a DM, I was blown away by the platform. It's so damn good, and on top of that, if you don't want to pay a sub fee, you do not have to. You can just pay a flat fee, which is perfectly realistic. That's what I did for a while. I did end up paying the sub fee just because I moved, and Wi-Fi stuff became a little bit more, uh, loosey-goosey to say the least. But I ran a game without paying a sub fee for a year, and it was great. I'm sorry if my answers aren't really specific. I can't give you a silver bullet to solve this problem. But yeah, I hope that helped you out. It's a really tough situation to be in. It's not easy to say goodbye to any big part of your life, and D&D can often become that big part of our life. So, you know, I wish you luck with whatever decision you make. Final question from Defiant Chaos. Join for the RPG horror stories. Still here for them. Rest of your content was just a massive bonus, although I haven't managed to see it all yet. So going on that note, worst player to player reaction you have ever been privy to while either playing or DMing. As I said, still catching up with your content, so not sure if it's already been answered, but if it has directions to the VOD, please. I might have answered this before, but like you said, I've made a lot of videos, so I just might not remember. I have covered the footnotes of the story before in a previous video. It was the 10,000 subscriber special linked in the cards. But yeah, I had a that guy, my very first D&D campaign. I know I referenced two things when I talk about my very first D&D campaign. My first homebrew D&D campaign is the one I usually talk about. That campaign went for 40 sessions, levels 3 to 18, and it was amazing. We went from beginning to end. We got a proper ending, and it was awesome. This story does not take place in that awesome campaign. It takes place in my actual first first campaign. I don't call it that, though, because this campaign died before we could get to the end. It was Curse of Strahd, and I had a player who was kind of a that guy. He was not perfect by any means. Again, I have a whole video talking about his antics and nonsense however point is what happened there were a few awkward interactions between this person and the rest of my table they were playing the wizard so we'll just call him wizard wizard had a habit of kind of telling other people what to do and how to play and i was new dm and i had the habit of not shutting that down when i probably should have but anyway yeah there are four situations i can come up with off the top of my head so the first one, second session, the party are in Barovia and they find a sad tavern with a bunch of sad people drinking away their sadness. Standard fare. The bard sees a woman who is drinking away her sorrows and walks over to talk to her. Before the bard can even open his mouth to say anything, the wizard's like, Oh, so you're gonna seduce her, right? The bard was shocked, to say the least, because at this point, this guy's played two sessions of D&D ever in his life, right? He has no idea what the horny bard trope is. Even if he did know, he had never said he was going to embody that trope. And even if the wizard was joking, it's just a weird thing to say at the second session. It was very strange. And the bard was just like, no, dude. And we all kind of got really awkward because it was just so, it was so weird. I cannot exaggerate enough. We're sitting at this table physically and we're all just staring at the dude like, what are you talking about, man? And he's just looking at us like we're the dumb ones. Like, oh, well, obviously he's going to seduce her, guys. No, duh. That was weird. And then the second weird interaction that I can think of off the top of my head 
is one where he was listening to the Dragonborn Paladin player talk, and at this point, no one was doing character voices, which is fine. Everyone was new to the game. I was doing character voices, but that's because I enjoyed that kind of thing. They don't need to. They're brand new, and even if they weren't brand new, it's their choice not to do that. That's okay. But anyway, the Dragonborn player is talking in first person, and he has his normal human-sounding voice. Perfectly okay. But, here's where the problem arises, the wizard, I guess, didn't like that because the wizard decides to just start repeating the Dragonborn's words in a deeper voice. Like, he's trying to coach him. And he's doing this weird, like, hand motion, encouraging hand motion, you know, like the type you do to a young child to get them to jump into the pool if they're afraid of water. It was so condescending. And that point, at that point, I, I told him to cut it out because I thought it was just that bad. Even though I was letting this guy slide a lot, that was one of the moments where I was just like, dude, don't, don't do that. I didn't say it in a firm way. I don't think I said it in a firm enough way. And unfortunately, even though I did say something, that moment was awkward enough that the Dragonborn player talked first person in character a hell of a lot less. Moving on from there, another awkward interaction, Hag boss fight. We bring in a new player. She was new to the group, but she had played D&D. She, however, had not played Rogue specifically at that point, so she was still kind of getting used to the mechanics of the class and such. And for some reason, the wizard player decided it was his job to coach the Rogue on mechanics that he's also not familiar with because he's also new to the game. And yeah, I understand, and I'm actually happy when players help each other, but his help was, first, it, it was good. It was good help. You know, he would say helpful things like, oh, hey, you know, this is how you roll initiative, because she forgot because she hadn't played D&D in a while up until that point. But she had played D&D before. There were a lot of things that she did understand. Like, she knew where movement was in her character sheet, and eventually his advice just got really annoying. And at one point, she just, like, looks at him and just says, dude, stop, I've got it. And even though it's a small thing, he doesn't back off. And she says, dude, stop, I've got it, again. And that's when it re gets really awkward because she said it twice, and I don't know why, but that just makes it way, way worse. Final situation, last session of this campaign. This is the smallest one, but for some reason, Strada broke the camel's back. The party are joking around, and yeah, new players. It happens, they joke around. And the guy loudly says, Guys, can you stop? Some people are actually trying to take this game seriously. Look, I get it, not everyone wants a jokey campaign, but also, let people have their fun and loosen up a little bit, come on! Sorry I ranted about these really awkward player-to-player -player interactions for a while, but yeah, that's the lot of the ones I remember. Look, it's been years. At this point, we'll call it even. I hope no ill will upon this person who, you know, was this irritating in my games. Of course, I'm not jumping at the opportunity to invite them back into my current games, but yep, we've gone our separate ways, and that is the way it is. All right, that was a long episode. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you guys want to see more of my content, then you can check out Tabletop Tavern Tips, where I give advice to both DMs and players old and new. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own questions or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment fallen order to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell.